Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all having a wonderful day today. Today, we're going to be talking about my very own Mark I upper receiver group. We're going to be going through all of the specifics about what goes into this build. But before we get into that, if you want to help the channel out, go ahead and like, share, and subscribe because all that sort of stuff is free and helps me out a lot. Go ahead and comment literally anything down below. And if you want to help me out personally, there's Subscribestar, which is basically just a pro to a Patreon. We just did a huge series of giveaways over there. And on top of that, there's also my website, where you can pick up certain items that I think are very cool. On top of that, I need to thank the sponsor of this video and the channel, and that is, of course, Gun Deals. Gun Deals, if you don't know, is a website that provides you with links to some of the best prices and products within the industry. So whatever it is that you happen to be looking for, go ahead and check out their website first, and they probably have a link or a coupon code for you to get it again for the best deals. So if saving money on cool gear is of interest to you, go ahead and check them out. Once again, that is gun.deals, and big thank you to those guys for helping me out. Now, today we're gonna to be talking about the Mark I, of course, and now full disclosure, this is my own upper receiver group. So I have personally selected all of the parts for this build and put them all together myself. And these are available on my website. So just go ahead and keep that in mind throughout the rest of the video that I do obviously have a financial stake in this upper receiver. So starting off with some of the boring specifications, just kind of going over the basic parts list and then later on we'll be doing a full build video or at least as much of a build video as I can do on YouTube. Uh, so first, first off, this is an 11 and a half inch 556 upper receiver group. The barrel that we went with, this is a Bear Creek Arsenal 11.5 barrel. This is 4150 chrome molly. It is a very, very tough barrel seal. We are of course running a carbine length gas system. 5.56, five, one in seven twists, we'll get to it later. But this uh, barrel is capable of very, very good accuracy. We'll show you that in all the testing. It is, I believe, an M4 profile, which is perfectly fine for a 10.5 or 11.5 barrel. Uh, it's going to be not the heaviest, not the lightest, and it's not gonna have any sort of weird cuts on it. It's also going to be fairly accurate. So the reason that I went with the Bear Creek Arsenal 11.5 for my Mark I series of builds is because of how much I liked it on the prototype, which is this rifle. You will have seen this rifle in other videos like two, three months ago. But basically this barrel, which is again, kind of the prototype, it's an 11 and a half inch 5.56 barrel, the exact same barrel. It performed very, very well. I liked it quite a bit. I liked the way it shot. I liked how accurate it was. So I thought this would be a very good starting point for my own Mark I upper receivers. And of course, the barrels on my Mark Ones are no different. They've all met or exceeded my expectations for how well gassed they are, how reliable they've been, which has been perfect up to this point. And uh, also on top of that, how accurate they are. And we will again get into that a little bit later. So uh, some people are not a big fan of Bear Creek Arsenal barrels. It's important to remember that Bear Creek Arsenal makes barrels for lots of other companies. So you probably have shot Bear Creek Arsenal barrels in other guns as well, because again, they are a manufacturer. So they actually manufacture a lot of barrels for a lot of different companies. Now the muscle device I do wanna mention on here, I personally have a Yankee Hill Machine flash hider on here. That is a QD mount for my suppressor, my form one suppressor. The regular Mark ones will be shipping with just a standard A2 flash hider. Now moving back from there, let's talk about the handguard. The handguard, as you can see on here, this is a Aim Sports. I believe this is their Gen 2 model. This is a seven-sided M-Lock handguard, 6061 aluminum, hard coat anodized. It does have anti-rotation tabs on either side, and these have a very tight fit to your upper receiver. So that means that basically, if you were to encounter a very, very hard impact with your rail, it's not going to shift left or right too much uh, just because you have those anti-rotation tabs that physically stop it from rotating. On top of that, we have good scalloping, on the top of the Picatinny rail. And of course, on the sides, we have easy access to our muzzle device because this is a 10 inch rail. So you do have a little bit of barrel sticking out of the end. So if you have different muzzle devices, they will all fit on this upper receiver. Now on top of that, we actually have real steel mounting hardware on the uh, handguard itself. These are torqued and loctited down to 35 inch pounds. Uh, our barrel nut is also steel. It's a very nice nitrided steel barrel nut. It's torqued down to 50 foot pounds. Every single barrel is torqued down to 50 foot pounds. Something I should mention, the gas block, this is a steel gas block and a stainless steel gas tube. Uh, nothing super special, just low profile standard carbine length 0.750 gas block. This is a dimpled barrel, so the rear set screw on the gas block does fit in very nicely inside of that dimple. And on top of that, they are locked in place using um, Permatex 272, which is a high temperature red thread locker, so it's semi-permanent. And of course, high temperature, so those screws will hold in place up to 450 degrees, which you still can, of course, reach that. Uh, if you do a lot of shooting quickly, your barrel and barrel nut, barrel uh, gas block will, of course, get up to 450 degrees, but it's going to hold significantly better than if you use standard Loctite, which only goes up to like 300 degrees. 
Now moving back from there, we of course have our standard mil spec upper receiver. So this is 7075 T6 aluminum, hard coat anodized. These are actually made by Cerro Forge. Cerro Forge has been making gun parts for 106 years. They're very, very good at what they do. And these uppers uh, have very, very good fitments to the lowers that I personally have. Though again, these are just mil specs. So there is going to be a tiny bit of wobble here. Uh, this is just a PSA lower, actually one of my old budget lowers that I have, uh, but they fit very, very nicely together. Cerro makes very, very good parts. Uh, mil spec dust cover and forward assist I know that there's nothing special there but there doesn't need to be anything special the upper does have machined in feed ramps m4 feed ramps to enhance your reliability and feeding just a little bit if we break this apart really fast we are gonna see that we have one of the nicest components on this build is going to be the bolt carrier group so we'll go ahead and talk about that for just a second this is a toolcraft mil spec ish bolt carrier group this is a very very nice phosphate coating it honestly looks very similar to nitride uh, just how nice the finish is on this bolt carrier uh, 8620 carrier and a carpenter 158 bolt which is mil spec the extractor is enhanced with an additional o-ring uh, which basically means that it has enhanced extraction force so the extraction force on this is very very good as well as the ejector pin also is very very strong so you get good ejection patterns uh, and reliable extraction all that sort of fun stuff but the thing that separates this carrier from a lot of other more budget carriers is that the carrier and the gas key itself are of course chrome lined now, chrome lining is one of the nicest things you can do to a barrel or a, any sort of hard use component uh, in terms of enhancing its reliability and its longevity. And with this, it's no different. Uh, chrome is incredibly hard, incredibly lubricious, and on top of that, very, very corrosion resistant. So it does everything it needs to do in your part that you know maintains the reliability of your firearm so going with chrome lining on the carrier itself and the gas key ensures that you're going to have proper reliability over long periods of time on top of that our gas key is staked according to mil spec and it is using true grade 8 fasteners grade 8 fasteners are much better than the yfs fasteners that you'll find on cheaper bolt carrier groups and i have had yfs screw shear on like some of my bear creek arsenal bolts and stuff like that which is why i wanted to go with a bit of an upgraded bolt so for the money i don't think you can get a better bolt carrier group than the toolcraft uh chrome lined bolt carrier groups they do an excellent job with uh, everything that they make and which is why they have so many contracts but the grade 8 fasteners on here proper staking on top of that there is a gasket sealer material put in between the carrier and the gas key so that it will basically never shift or have any sort of gas leakage or anything like that on top of that the fitment to the bolt and the carrier is very very tight from the box they have a very smooth like glass feeling and that is of course helped with the chrome lining on the interior of the carrier but these carriers have done a excellent job i have no problem with them whatsoever and in fact these would be an upgrade to basically any standard kind of nitride bolt carrier group that you have in your basic ars last and least on our upper receiver we have a mil spec 7075 charging handle Personally, charging handles can be the biggest waste of money in terms of value per dollar. If you buy like a $100 radian, you don't really get a lot of extra value unless you just need it for like ambidextrate sterity or anything like that. But for me personally, mil spec does just fine. I have mortared plenty of mil spec charging handles without issue. And of course they're very strong and they don't add anything to the cost. So now let's go ahead and talk about some of the reasons behind the components that I chose. And then of course we'll talk about how it actually performed. So the 11.5 barrel, that's what I wanted to start with because 10.5 is a great barrel length it's very short it's very handy uh, however you do run into issues with it being, being a little bit more violent a little harder on your components on top of that you have very very little dwell time now you would think 10 and a half inch versus 11 and a half inch it's only an inch difference but with that extra inch of barrel you get 40 to 50 percent more dwell time which means you have extra area where you have actual pressure at the gas port so your gas port does not need to be as large as it is on a 10.5 barrel uh, so which means you have generally speaking a little bit smoother of a recoil impulse now the 11.5 also has an additional benefit of getting an extra 100 to 150 fps depending on your load and 5.56 is a very very speed dependent cartridge so if you want it to do good things good expansion good fragmentation with like your 55 grain m193 you need to have that velocity if you get this guy going below 24 2300 fps it basically acts like a pistol round at that point without much tumbling or expansion or fragmentation but 
the standard velocity on this should be around 27, 2750, depending on how hot of a load you're running through. And that is more than enough inside of 100, 150 yards to get that good expa expansion and fragmentation. So the 11.5 barrel is really what I wanted for this upper receiver. It is possibly the best overall SBR-ish barrel length, uh, just in terms of size to performance. It does very, very well. Now on top of that, I wanted to pair it with a very, very high quality bolt carrier because your barrel and your bolt carrier basically run the entire system and then everything else just kind of sits there. So the bolt carrier, I needed something that was going to be very, very high quality, sort of a mil spec plus just a little bit. So the Toolcraft makes an excellent BCG. You have enhanced extractors on it. You have chrome lining, very, very good chrome lining on it, which means that it's going to be able to cut through dirt and debris whatsoever. In fact, this upper receiver, uh, this one specifically, I've tested a lot of these obviously. Uh, this one's at about 700 rounds and I haven't cleaned it without issue. The red one, the prototype, is at about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 rounds. That one there I've taken out to 530 yards with just a 1 to 6 and it was very, very accurate. So the last thing that I kind of want to go over a little more in depth on is going to be this handguard. I wanted something because Generally speaking, when you're running a short barreled gun, you know, you're going to run out of rail space if you want to attach a lot of stuff. This one here only has a light and a grip on the front rail, uh, which isn't a ton, but if you're like trying to run like an IR unit and stuff like that, you're going to run out of rail space very, very quickly. So one way to kind of get around that, or at least to give you some more options, is to go with something that is seven-sided M-Lock. So not only do you have your 10 inches of Picatinny on top, but you also have all the possible mounting options you want all the way around the handguard. On top of that, I've had very, very good luck with the Aim Sports handguard. I have a couple of them on my personal rifles, on my SPR builds and stuff like that. They're very strong. They're not the most expensive handguards, not the most Gucci handguards on the market, but they're very strong and they have good lightweight cuts, ventilation cuts on the top and the sides. So even though there is quite a bit of material here, because they're not like super thin handguards, um, they still do a good job of being strong and lightweight, good ventilation, all that sort of stuff. And of course, that seven-sided M-Lock gives you as much mounting possibilities as you can with a short handguard. Now, one thing I do want to say before we get into how exactly performed is that these do come with a unlimited lifetime warranty. Uh, it is, of course, transferable. So if you sell this to somebody else or somebody else has it, it breaks, they can just send it back and I will fix it for them. So what that means basically is if you have a parts failure of any sort, I will replace it for you for free. Now, on top of that, there also is a rebarreling policy. Uh, so these barrels are going to last you anywhere between 15 and 25,000 rounds, depending on how much steel case you shoot through it, how aggressive your firing cycle is. Uh, so with that being said, I really, really like these barrels. So the first rebarrel is going to be free on me. So basically you burn out one of these barrels by putting 10, 15, 20,000 rounds through it. It has a loss of accuracy. So it's no longer holding two, three or four MOA with even just ball ammunition. Go ahead and send it back to me and I will of course rebarrel it for you. The only thing that's not covered on the upper receiver is going to be intentional destruction. So basically if you throw this into an incinerator and by virtue of being an incinerator, it incinerates the upper receiver, you're going to be SOL. But everything else normal wear and tear you have a problem with your bolt your anything charging handle dust cover anything on here breaks it is of course covered under that warranty and you will get a new one for free so now with all of that out of the way let's go ahead and talk about how it performed so first off this is not going to be a race gun uh, so in terms of gassing this is going to be a little bit over gas it's going to be about 10 percent more gas than you really need with most steel cased ammunition you should be getting anywhere from 3.30 to 4 o'clock ejection with an H2 buffer which is my recommendation on these uppers and with brass cased ammunition again depending on how hot your load you're going to be anywhere between 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock. Now you could tune the gas down just a little bit more than that. However, me personally, I like to have it a little more over gas because I do not treat my upper receivers very well and I run a lot of really crappy steel cased ammunition through them. So. This one here, as you see it for the last 700 rounds, has been using an H2 buffer in the back with a Strike Industries flat wire recoil spring. I just prefer that recoil impulse. That is what I've used for, you know, three, four, five years at this point. So when I have that buffer set up in the back, it's just what I'm used to. So the buffer system combined with sort of the mid-level gassing on the barrel means that you can shoot this very, very quickly, very accurately, again, depending on if your skills are there. Uh, this, again, this isn't a race gun. It's going to be a little bit more snappy than some of your ultra well gassed guns but again for me personally for crappy ammunition crappy circumstances I like having just a little bit more gas than I need in the system to again function reliably without beating up your components 
So in terms of short-barreled ARs and being fun to shoot, all of the Mark 1s and of course the prototype as well uh, that I've shot are probably my number two favorite uh, just in terms of being fun to shoot. Slightly behind the Roscoe, the Roscoe 12.5 has a slightly softer recoil impulse and on top of that, that barrel is incredibly accurate. It shot back to back sub MOA loads uh, with three or four different types of ammunition. It is incredibly accurate and again with an appropriate cost increase as well. So these are very, very fun to shoot. The reliability on the prototype as well as all of the Mark 1s that I've shot up to this point, which is like 9 or 10 so far, uh, has been 100% without fail. Now let's go ahead and talk about the accuracy. I mentioned it earlier, but uh, these are actually surprisingly accurate. Now, these are tested at 50 yards, mostly because I don't have any high power magnification scopes and I want to remove as much of me from the equation as possible. I use a Caldwell uh, tripod for the shooting from the prone position. So it's just one of those really short tripods that kind of locks the whole gun down. Uh, for this accuracy testing, I was using this Blackhound 1 to 6 at 50 yards with a variety of different ammunition. Uh, the accuracy testing was done again after about 700 rounds. I like to do accuracy testing basically right before I talk about the upper receiver so that the barrel has as much time as possible to be broken and to be, you know, completely filled up with all the good copper and stuff like that. Though again, I don't treat them well. I shoot a lot of steel case ammunition. So with all of that out of the way, I'm just going to let the gun and the paper do the talking. Yikes. So as you can see with this upper receiver, if you feed it high quality ammunition, you are going to get high quality groups. Now, is this going to shoot one MOA with every load that you put through it? Of course not, because no upper receiver will do that. If you put crappy ammunition through your gun, you're going to most likely get crappy groups. Now, that being said, I had two back-to-back -back groups with the PPU match and the 77 grain uh, IMI Razor Core. Both of those shot right at a half inch at 50 yards. I'll show you pictures with the micrometer. Uh, so that is basically one MOA at 100 yards. So this is absolutely a one MOA or very, very close to a one MOA gun, provided that you're doing your part with the right ammunition. If you feed it more ball ammunition, you can expect anywhere from two to three ammunition, two to three MOA, which Again, for just regular ball off the shelf ammo is very very good with match loads you should absolutely no problem be able to get right on one moa with these upper receivers and again each one of these upper receivers is put together by me by hand everything is fitted together so that each component fits well if something doesn't fit well together i don't put it together we'll go ahead and go over the build video in just a minute but these upper receivers are very, very accurate. Not sub MOA, I wouldn't claim that they're gonna be sub MOA or like half MOA with whatever load you wanna put through it, but with the right loadings, you are going to be right on top of one MOA all day long. And I'll go ahead and roll in some B-roll of the Mark I prototype going out to 530 yards suppressed. So these upper receivers will absolutely get you out to 600, 700 yards, if again, you're capable of doing that without issue, provided you're again, feeding it with the right sort of ammunition. So now with all that out of the way, now let's go ahead and show you a little bit how these guys are put together. So today we're gonna to be taking you guys through the build process of the upper receivers, basically just going over some of the stuff we do to make sure they are as reliable as possible and show, take you guys along. So starting off with the upper receiver, this is a Cerro Forging upper receiver. This is one of the most important components on any build and probably one of the least talked about. So Cerro Forge has been making gun parts for 106 years at this point. They make a really, really high quality product. This is a 7075 T6 aluminum, hard coat anodized, mil spec upper receiver. It is not T marked on top. If you care, personally, it's not that big of a deal to me. We do have a mil spec dust cover and forward assist. Everything on here looks quite nice. We do have nice ramping here on the side and your notch for your uh, charging handle. Threads on it look quite nice. Everything on here is in really, really good shape. 
We also have really nice beveling on your pivot and takedown pins for easier insertion. Yes, that's what she said. Go ahead and take our microfiber cloth, clean out the inside of where our barrel extension is going to go, just to make sure that that is as clean of a mounting surface as possible. Now let's go ahead and talk about the barrel. This is a 11 and a half inch 556 chambering barrel. Uh, this is 4150, so it's not like a stainless steel barrel or anything else like that. We have a very nice phosphate finish on it. Uh, it's not quite as nice as of course like a nitride finish would be but it's also going to be proportionally less expensive i've had really really good luck with bear creek arsenal barrels for in terms of being kind of gassed in the middle they're not crazy over gas they're not under gas they're kind of right in the sweet spot uh, not necessarily for a race gun but definitely for a gun that's going to do whatever you want it to do so going over some of the, the specifics this is of course as i mentioned 11 and a half inches 556 five, one in seven twists so this will stabilize your light loads your heavy loads basically anything you can put through it it does use a single dimple on the underside of your barrel that is perfectly aligned with the gas block. And that will basically just lock your gas block in place so that it does not move whatsoever. It should be noted that this little section right here is going to have a higher surface finish than the rest of the barrel, just because that is the mounting point for your gas block. So you have the tightest gas seal possible. Now up front, the threading is of course half by 28, which is very standard. We also have a very nice, I believe it's a 11 degree target crown just to kind of protect the internal thread so that you don't mess up the last, you know, little bit of your barrel before the bullet actually goes out of it. Most of the time we're using muzzle devices, but it is still nice to see. Moving to the back to the barrel extension, I just do a couple very simple tests. So the first one is gonna be actually running my finger on the feed ramps, uh, which I should note that the upper receiver does have machined in M4 feed ramps for enhanced reliability, that sort of thing. Uh, but the feed ramps feel very, very good. There's no burrs or anything else like that. If there were a sharp edge, everything would need to get polished before it gets shipped out or even test fired. Now, one of the most important things to check with any barrel is going to be the upper receiver and barrel fit. Depending on the manufacturer, you can get a lot of wobble in your upper receiver and barrel. These fit very nicely together, even with just a little bit of pressure. So that just means that the extension ring here on your barrel extension and your upper receiver are concentric so that they lock up together quite nicely. That means that, that you're going to have a tighter fit and that overall, theoretically, the accuracy is going to be a little bit better. Now, you can't really talk about the barrel without talking about the bolt carrier group. So we might as well take one of those guys out right now so I can show that to you. These are our Toolcraft. These are a very standard mil spec bolt carrier group. Very, very shiny. This looks like a nitride coating. However, this is actually a phosphite coating. However, you can see the phosphate coating has a much higher surface than the phosphate coating on the Bear Creek Arsenal barrel. Uh, they do an excellent job with this bolt carrier. So the first thing that we're gonna do is actually take off some of the excess oil and just grime that it gets from sitting inside of a cardboard tube for long periods of time. Then we're gonna actually take it apart and check it. But before we do that, we can do a very simple gas ring check, which is going to be that the bolt carrier group does not extend by its own weight and it also does not um, depress by its own weight. So that just means that the gas rings have proper tightness against the actual carrier itself so that, again, they provide the best seal to, to ensure proper reliability. Now, before we take this guy apart, we can very easily check to see if these two will fit together and if they pass a very simple test. So when it is fully locked, this should rotate freely, not hitting any of the lugs. And then it should, again, unlock and pull itself free, just like it does. So we have no problems there. The fit feels very nice and tight. Um, one thing I will say about these bolt carriers is that the fit between the bolt and the carrier on this is a lot tighter than I've seen on other less expensive bolt carriers. Sometimes you'll have wobble between the bolt and bolt carrier. Not so with these guys. Now let's go ahead and take this guy apart and kind of show you guys what's going on with the internals. You of course just have your standard takedown pin here. Take off our firing pin. Cam pin. This is a phosphate cam pin. It has a slightly different look than the bolt carrier group itself, but it's still very, very standard. Now you can see on our bolt here, it does have some actual lubrication on it from the factory. <laughs> some of these have a lot of lube, some of them don't have very much, but that's just kind of a factory thing. These all get lubricated before they're test fired and shipped out. That way they're, when you when they arrive to your door, they are ready to go out of the box. Now, this is a mil spec Carpenter 158 bolt. So that is what the military uses and it's perfectly fine. There is some argument between uh, 
9310 or Carpenter 158. Carpenter 158 is perfectly fine and I, I don't think most people have any issue with it whatsoever. This is magnetic particle inspected so basically they you know put it in a machine to make sure that there are no invisible cracks or any actual defects with the material itself. I should note that on the extractor here it does have quite a bit of extraction force. It takes a lot of force to get that to move and that is because it is o-ring enha enhanced with the Viton o-ring. So this has a lot of extraction force which is very very good. On top of that checking the ejector does also require a considerable amount of force to depress the ejector. The firing pin itself this is a hard chrome uh, firing pin just mil spec it's not like an enhanced or an extended firing pin in any way so overall this is a fairly standard bolt carrier and then again when we look inside the actual carrier itself it is very nicely chrome lined it feels exceptionally smooth that is one of the big selling points of this bolt carrier group is that not only is the finish on it exceptional but also the gas key and the carrier itself are chrome lined so that is going to be one chrome is extremely hard extremely strong and extremely lubricious so it does very very well in high temperature situations where of course you can have a lot of dirt and grime but it's not really going to stick to the chrome lining and on top of that it's very very corrosion resistant uh, which is one of the things that you look for in a bolt care group uh, that kind of separates it from some of the lower tier bolt care groups is actually having the chrome lining on the gas key and the carrier itself which is going to again help ensure long-term durability now talking about the gas key you can see that it is properly staked with fairly substantial staking on the true grade 8 fasteners so I've had YFS screws break these are not YFS screws these are true grade 8 mil spec uh, gas key screws that are going to uh, continue working long after YFS have already sheared off on top of that the Toolcraft BCGs, I believe they use a layer of Permatex uh, gasket in between the carrier and the gas key itself. And then of course they clean out the actual gas port from the gas key to the, uh, to the bolt carrier in general. So now we're just gonna go ahead and get the carrier back together. And as you can tell, it is a very tight fit, fit, though it does spin freely, which is nice. There is again, very, very good tolerances in between the bolt and the carrier. Go ahead and slide in our cam pin, adjust it properly. Drop our firing pin back down there. Doop. And we are ready to rock and roll. Alrighty, now we need to go ahead and assemble our upper receiver. So we're going to go ahead and put it in this Wheeler vice block. There's a lot of good vice blocks on the market. All have their strengths and weaknesses. This one here I find to be not quite as fast as some of the other ones, but it's very strong and very, very simple. Now we align all of our barrels and upper receivers vertically. Uh, that way there we allow gravity to do its thing and keep the barrel extension and receiver extension on your upper receiver as concentric as possible by again allowing gravity to help us out just a little bit now before we actually make these up I've already cleaned out the inside of the upper receiver but we'll go ahead and make sure there's no excess contaminants on the barrel up barrel receiver extension and again have a nice fit together so now let's go ahead and talk about our barrel nut this is a very simple barrel nut this is a steel barrel nut which I prefer to aluminum I don't think you need to save an ounce or two on the thing that holds your barrel together as you can see this is very nicely nitrated has huge wrench flats on the four sides and most importantly does not need to be timed with the hand guard to ensure proper fitment which is always a plus so Let's go ahead and take this over here, get it installed. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and get this guy hand tight on there. Again, making sure that our barrel remains concentric. And again, we're allowing gravity to help us out just a little bit. Now, uh, to get this snug on here, mill spec is anywhere from 35 to 80 foot pounds, which is a huge margin. We are going to be using a snap-on crow's foot. This is an inch and an eighth because we are Gucci like that. And that's gonna fit on here just like so. And then we're gonna use our torque wrench once we get it actually set to 50 foot-pounds. So let's go ahead, tighten this guy up to 50 foot-pounds. The reason I do 50 is because it's a good middle ground. It's not too crazy, but it's definitely uh, gonna ensure that there, that barrel nut does not go anywhere. So now we're gonna go ahead, get this guy hooked up. Start over here, all right. That was one, and go one more time just for good luck. All right, 
So now this barrel nut is torqued down to 50 foot pounds on the upper receiver and this barrel is going absolutely nowhere. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about gas blocks and gas tubes, roll pins, all that sort of fun stuff. This is generally speaking the worst part of any build. It is however a lot easier if you use a hollow roll pin and a just a simple rubber mallet. Don't use anything too crazy on here. Talking about the gas block, this is just a standard steel gas block. So it's not aluminum or anything else like that. It is a low profile. 0.750 on the internal diameter, which is very, very smooth, which is nice, which is going to provide us again with a good seal between the inside of the gas block and the outside of the barrel. Uh, now this barrel, this gas block is going to be just as strong as the barrel. So as soon as this is set in place with the two set screws on the bottom, in the dimple on top of the red permatex that we're going to put on these uh, this gas block is going to go absolutely nowhere the gas tube itself has a very nice no wobble fit to the gas block and it is just standard carbine length stainless steel so there's no problems nothing special about any of this but this is just exactly what you want something that's going to be very strong very durable and isn't going to fail on you. so next up we actually need to line up and install our gas block there are a lot of different ways to do this i like to go off of the detent on the barrel itself because i know that the detent detent on the barrel is true to the actual gas port, so though I know that's going to align up perfectly basically every time. And this does have a little bit of a tight fit, which is exactly what you want to see. Sometimes you need to take a little rubber mallet and just tap it down into position. All right, now we want to go ahead and line up again via the detent on the bottom. And this does have a very tight fit on here, so we're just going to use our little rubber mallet and go ahead and line that up basically perfect one or two more just to make sure that that is 100% perfect on the bottom there and it looks like it is it's gonna line up 100% there next we're gonna go ahead and install our detent but before we do that we need to talk about permatex this is the thread locker red high temperature so this is semi-permanent but also high temperature standard only goes up to 300 degrees this one here goes up to 450. all right so starting off with our wheeler fat wrench we are going to torque these guys down to exactly 25 inch pounds not foot pounds so we're going to be 25 inch pounds on here 20 foot pounds will strip them out entirely we're going to apply a little dash of this permatex red just enough to cover up all the threads as there is not that much here to begin with Whoop. All right, a little bit. You only need a little drop. Now we're going to go ahead and come over here and install it. And then again, we're just going to go up to 25 inch pounds. All right. And once more. All right, so let's go ahead and just clean that up just a little bit. Now, anecdotally, a good way to see if you actually made it into the detent on your barrel is if the rear uh, gas block screw is in a little bit deeper than the front one. And as you can see, they are when they're fully tight down there again to 25 inch pounds. And so you can tell that this barrel or this gas block should be good, good to go. Although we are, of course, going to actually live fire test it. So this is our AIM Sports. I believe this is the Gen 2 version. This is the 10 inch, 10 and a half inch uh, M lock rail that we're going to be using on this upper receiver. As you can see, it uses a clamping style method on the actual barrel nut itself, which does not need to be timed. And it comes with anti rotation tabs installed so that this uh, rail theoretically won't shift on you. It has great ventilation on the sides and the top. The top Picatinny rail is scalloped out quite nicely. So not only is this a fairly strong uh, handguard, but this is also going to be fairly lightweight with really good ventilation. And it actually does have true seven sided M lock for all your mounting possibilities, which is great on a shorter rail where you don't necessarily have as much Picatinny rail. You want as many mounting options as possible. Now, some of these have a very, very tight fit around the upper receiver. As you'll notice right there, there appears to be a gap so that the uh, anti-rotation tabs are fitting too tightly against the upper receiver. However, with our, oh, there it goes, slid right down into place and there is absolutely no left and right wobble whatsoever. There's some forward and back obviously because it's not tight, but there is no left and right wobble in there and the fit to the upper receiver is absolutely excellent. Now let's go ahead and install our mounting hardware. So we have these square steel bits that are going to fit on one side and then our screws that are going to go down into the other side. Sometimes these can be a little bit of a tight fit to actually get in place, but of course because they're square they're not going to actually rotate on us. Now we have our screws. Now, as you can see, these screws have some blue Loctite that Loctite applied to them from the factory, which is quite nice, so that these screws are also not gonna come loose on you. 
Uh, just for the moment, I'm just going to tighten them down with the included tool. Uh, your upper receiver will actually ship with this tool, so no need to go out and pick it up. This is just a simple Allen hex key. Now, let's go ahead and put in the bottom one as well. And then we're actually going to torque these down uh, with the Wheeler fat wrench as well to 35 inch pounds. Alrighty, now we're going to go ahead and tighten these guys down to 35 inch pounds. And now, the important thing to note about clamp style hand guards is that at this point, even though I've done 35 inch pounds on both, that's not really how it works. So you need to go back and forth until both stop moving at 35 inch pounds. Because of course, as you clamp down on one side, it gets a little easier on the other side. So I want both of them to truly be at 35 inch pounds, which is right here. Whereas you can see, I'm not getting any more movement out of either one while still set to again, 35 inch pounds. Boom. All right, now for the last little bit on our upper receiver, we're going to install our CAC industry standard A2 flash hider. Now, A2 flash hiders are some of my favorite muscle devices because they're incredibly simple, they do their job very well, and they're very easy to switch off for something else if you so desire. That in conjunction with the fact that we have an 11 and a half inch barrel, a 10 and a half inch uh, handguard means that we have easy and quick access to the muzzle device. I like to keep mine neutral timed. You can time yours however you want, but there is your A2 flash hider installed and ready to go. Something to note on shorter barrels is that these A2 flash hiders do have a tendency to push the muzzle down just a little bit. So depending on your setup, you may or may not like that. Alrighty, now let's go ahead and get this guy out of there so we can actually get it into its semi-final state. So, we get our charging handle. This is a Teflon coated 7075 anodized. So it's Teflon coated on top of the anodization. So this is a very, very slick charging handle. Also, this is actual true 7075. So it's going to be very strong. Uh, personally, in my opinion, charging handles are the biggest waste of money if you spend $100 on a Radian, uh, at least in terms of price to performance as they don't really add much with a high quality AR-15, you really shouldn't have to use them whatsoever. Everything does of course fit together nicely, no problems, dust door works just fine. And now this is ready to ship. Well, not really actually. What we need to do first is we actually need to test fire it. So this is actually one of my uppers that has been built and is ready to ship. And on this one here, go into detail for you. This one here is upper number five. Now upper number five has a corresponding chart on it that's going to tell me its ejection pattern, how it performed, anything that it needs. So every upper comes with this sheet of paper that is basically going to tell you how it did and what I recommend for it, you know, when it was tested, who it was tested by, function, a couple different ammos that I test it with. So in this case, this upper receiver here, upper receiver number five, this one here is actually gonna end up being number eight that I just built for you guys. Uh, so this one here, the ejection pattern with M193 is two o'clock, perfectly fine. Uh, lock back on empty, of course. Second test is gonna be two of 55 grain, ejection pattern of 330, that's perfect. Lock back on empty, of course. Uh, I even tell you the lubrication that I used was Remington CLP. The test buffer and spring were standard three ounce carbine buffer, standard carbine spring. My recommendation, however, is probably gonna be an H2 just to get that ejection pattern a little bit softer with M193. I prefer flat wire enhanced recoil spring, but you don't necessarily need it. Now on top of that, you have all of your torque specs on your actual sheet here. So it's gonna have your handguard screw, your barrel nut torque, your gas block torque, all of that on this piece of paper. So if you ever forget it, you can just look on the sheet that comes with your, uh, that comes with your upper receiver. Now something that I should note is while the gas block screws do have the high temperature red Loctite applied, the barrel nut does not. The reason for that is that with 50 foot pounds of torque on the barrel nut, if you apply red thread locker on top of that high temp red thread locker, you are never going to get that off. So if you ever send it back to me to get rebarreled, that will be an absolute nightmare. However, if you, for whatever reason, just say, hey, I really want the red thread locker applied to the barrel nut, I will do that for you. Though again, if I have to take it apart in the future, I will not like it. So then at this point, we're gonna go ahead, and put our paperwork back in here. Now at this point, our new upper receiver is going to get bagged and wrapped. And before I completely send it away, 
I do need to mark this one as upper receiver number eight. That way there, when I'm actually out testing these upper receivers, I know exactly which one is doing what and how they're performing. That way there, when you open up the box, you know exactly how yours has done. And again, just my very simple live fire testing. Every upper gets test fired and lubricated before it ships to you. After the Mark 1s are put together, each one gets hand tested by me. I run a couple different loads through each one to make sure that it will run with your, again, high powered military ammunition and of course your really cheap steel case ammunition. At this point, I have had absolutely zero issues with the test firing whatsoever, uh, but I give you a full rundown of everything on there again, the temperature of the day, uh, what buffer, what spring I was using, you know, everything that goes into it, and then any sort of recommendations on top of that. And again, my purpose in this build was to not make the cheapest upper receiver on the market because you can, of course, buy cheaper, but what I wanted to bring was one of the highest values. So we're using very, very high quality components that are gonna keep the gun running for long periods of time, uh, specifically the very, very nice Toolcraft BCG combined with one of my favorite sort of budget end barrels that is still properly gassed. It's a little over gassed, but that's kind of in the sweet spot for me personally. However, if you're only going to be shooting it suppressed with M193 or name your other hot ammunition, then you might want a little bit of a heavier buffer in the back or to go with something that is a little bit uh, on the softer side in terms of gassing. The selection of high quality parts is one of the reasons that I am very confident in this upper receiver and I can of course offer a lifetime warranty with the first rebarreling for free. Not only do I have high confidence in the components that I've selected, but also in the fact that I have very diligently put each one of these together by hand. Everything is properly torqued and tested before it ships. Everything is lubricated and ready to go outside of the box. Now, of course, uh, I do make money off these upper receivers, not too much, but I do make a little bit of money off these upper receivers. So of course, take that into account when you're thinking about buying a Mark I, but Hopefully I've at least given you guys a good overview of the selection of components, why, some of the build process, and of course how it performs, at least in my personal testing. And again, every single one of these gets hand tested by me before they ship. So that is really about it for the video, guys. I know this is gonna be a bit of a long video, but this is something that I really like and I really want to be doing more of these in the future. So when basically, when the Mark 1s sell out, then I'll work on designing a Mark 2, some other build, probably not an 11.5, maybe we'll do like a 12.5 or a 16 or a 14.5 or something cool. So with all of that out of the way, guys, I do wanna thank you guys who made it all the way to the end of the video, guys. Uh, so just. Thanks for watching, you know, if you are interested in, if you have any comments or questions, go ahead and leave them down below and I will see you guys in the next one. Peace off.